My experience last fall with the producer Lunch and Learn that we hosted, there were a lot of industry members, allied industry, in that room because they wanted to hear about economics. <laughs> but they were in the room and they didn't necessarily know much about the NPIP biosecurity plans and audits. So I wanted to be able to introduce that to allied industry and encourage them to write their own biosecurity plan. And to also mention that there are two allied industry members that I've been working with in the last year that are working on their own biosecurity plan as a service to their producer clients. Um, is that is Mel yep, they are going hardcore. They've made almost $200,000 of improvements and changes just to their operation in order to provide better peace of mind and to Mama Mills okay. out of Little Falls. Okay. Yeah. Um, and they are really taking it seriously. I would like to use them as a model. <laughs> um, and they, they took that initiative. And I wanted to be able to share that with other allied members. So that's what this was about. Um, so we're gonna start with what is biosecurity basically, okay? I use this image to teach 4-H kids, because this is generally what they think biosecurity is. It's this guy in a hazmat suit, right? But, no. <laughs> and then we have the conversation about what do their friends think who aren't involved in animal agriculture? What do they think maybe biosecurity is? And for sure it's this image. Um, so basically, Okay. So if we dissect the word biosecurity, bio is life, the study of life sciences, biology, right? And security obviously is protection. So the whole basis of the word is life protection. We practice biosecurity every day. We wash our hands, right? We clean our cooking surface. Well, well, okay. We, we intend to wash our hands every day. We intend to clean our cooking surfaces after handling raw meat or um, just preparing food in general, right? Those things are instilled in us as, as young people. But we consider it hygiene, right? Not biosecurity. Biosecurity is a more scary word. So we see that as hygiene. But really it's biosecurity because we are preventing and reducing the spread of potentially infectious disease, whether it is E. coli or salmonella or high path influenza. Okay, so that's what biosecurity is. And one thing, I, a key message that I've taken from these discussions that we've had with producers, with Dale and with Shauna, um, and with other allied industry members, this is a community effort. It's not just the farmers. It's not just the renderers. It is everybody that needs to participate in the industry, that is participating in the industry, also needs to participate in biosecurity. And it will look different, just like it looks different for every participating farm. It's gonna look different for every allied industry member as well. So, do I need to go through some of these numbers? Yes, no? Everybody's saying no. Okay, so we have seen this map. There were 21 states affected with, uh, that had confirmed cases of high path influenza. The stretch looks really weird. So um, there were um, $1.6 billion in direct economic impact, more than $3 billion in total economic impact. And that was published by USDA in 16 or 17. My work still revolves around <laughs> even four years later. So there's still, I think, even more money being added to that um, total. <laughs> total impact from taxpayers is $990 million. $200 million of that was in indemnity costs. $600 was the response sending out response teams to locations. Um, and to be honest, USDA is a real thrilled with the possibility of that happening again. Um, it's sort of scary, <laughs> having a number that large. 
But um, there are also a lot of waste of dollars in there too, which is unfortunate. Which is unfortunate. And when was the last time we had a major event like that? It had been 15 years. <coughs> so how things are going to be responded to are going to change in that amount of time. Um, and if I've heard Dr. Cardona say it once, it's been a thousand times, we're always ready for the last outbreak. <laughs> So we were likely prepared for the last outbreak of ENT in the early 2000s. You know, California is still dealing with it. Although, they've had two weeks in a row where they haven't had new confirmations. So yay, California. It just took a year to get that done. Um, so the 17 trading partners instituted a complete ban on US poultry products. More than 30 did a partial ban. Um, last week, I actually had the opportunity to talk with people from the country of Turkey, who I believe are still not importing everything poultry related from the U.S. Um, so that was an interesting experience. I know Dale, Shauna, you guys met with them as well. Yep. So it has an impact, right? So it's going to take the community to have good biosecurities in order to avoid something like this happening again to this magnitude. Um, in Minnesota, 10% of our turkey inventory was affected, 4 million layers on 110 farm sites in 23 of our Minnesota counties. Um, the Maroon Star, that's where we are now. So we were pretty close to the area. Um, so with NPIP, are you all familiar with that plan and that system? Tom, maybe not. No, I'm thinking, I was trying to remember what it stands for. But. The National Poultry Improvement Program. Okay, that's why I'm here. So. Okay. Good. And it's been um, around for a long time. I think Dale and Shauna can probably give more history if you have more questions about that. But essentially, through the General Conference Committee, they <laughs> decided that there needs to be an expectation of increased biosecurity moving forward. There will set standards of accepted minimum biosecurity practices. And that ended up as a 14 point biosecurity um, suggestions, of which number 14 is an audit that has to happen every two years. Um, that audit is going to be done by the official state agency, which in Minnesota will be Dale and Shauna. In other states, it's their Department of Agriculture or their animal health system. It will look different in every state. Um, I am learning. I am very grateful for Shauna and Dale having a different sort of, and having Board of Animal Health separate from the Department of Agriculture. Like you run your own office. I'm learning that's a, an asset in this world. Well, is that correct, Kevin? No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so these 14 principles are what the producers of a certain size, I'll get to that, need to write a biosecurity plan about. Then that will be audited by Dale and Shauna over the course of the next two years, hopefully. Well, I will get that. So the intent of these minimum practices are so that we're all on the same page, biosecurity-wise. That doesn't mean that's the minimum you have to do, but that's the minimum we want done and approved by the official state agency. And invite more to happen. Um, but these plans with these minimum requirements need to be written on paper, taken out of our heads, put down on paper, and audited in order for that facility to be eligible for indemnity should there be another outbreak of high path so technically, yes, these are um, voluntary, but if you do choose not to participate, you will not be paid if you have another high path outlet. And poultry is the first industry to do something like this. Who made that decision? What did it Um <laughs> Basically, it's gonna be a matter of whether they have a plan that's been audited on file with USDA. There's been question in the past about 
what if there's an outbreak today and not everybody in the state has been audited yet? What will happen? I throw that totally to Dale and Shauna to answer that question. So in 2015, they asked the affected producers, did you have a biosecurity plan? And it was simply a verbal yes. Moving forward, because the feds aren't going to spend a billion dollars again, they want to make sure that somebody is going to oversee the biosecurity And they're not going to do it with a simple, um, yeah, my company veterinarian signed off on it. They want some regulatory oversight, and, it's, and it seems to be that um, the NPIP is an appropriate part for that because if changes need to happen down the road with biosecurity, those changes can be made within the NPIP as opposed to having a USDA regulation that says this is going to be, it's going to be black and white and this is what it's going to be. So we're not just trying to prevent high path influenza with this. Obviously that's the reason why this whole system was created. But having a good biosecurity plan is also going to help with every day-to-day -day diseases and infections that are common in the poultry industry. So that's what you have to think of again, is the whole community. How are we just going to keep our birds healthy in general? The first audits have to be completed by September of next year. Um, I think we are healthfully 50% completed. Um, and that's been a large part to the association. Shauna saying yes, Dale's going. Mm. <laughs> or you have at least had contact. Maybe not completed, but contact and work in process. In process. Um, Minnesota has a large number of these audits to complete compared with New Mexico that had two. Um, what dictates what, whether they need to have a plan done is their pro annual production. And those numbers are there. Um, that doesn't mean we're not going to highly encourage lower production farms to do this because we want to. Again, I don't know how many times I'm going to say it's a community effort to keep all the birds in this state healthy and happy. So it's going to take an effort on everybody, including the backyard chicken people. And yes, I have to deal with backyard chicken people, and we're really encouraging their biosecurity practices also, and reporting of any illnesses. Um, are, are those annual numbers? Or these are annual production. Are annual. annual production per site. Yeah. Um, there's six farms in Minnesota, I think, that reach, approach these numbers. So, so can, can typically the game farm, they'll have their breeder's flock and then they will raise all the chicks before they're released so they can accumulate. And that's how they reach that number. On a site at one time before they release them and all around the river. Before they send them off to South Dakota, wherever they're going. Sure. So they'll raise them. So typically, those are hatchery, breeder flock, and grow operations on the same one site. So that's why you would get up to that number. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and for like the brothers, typically, if they have 50,000 in the flock and they run through a couple of flocks in the year, that's going to get to that 100,000. Yeah, I can see that number. Um, and also, the breeders weren't on that list. Um, but Dale and Sean are encouraging if they are supplying breeders to a large operation, specifically in Minnesota because of our large companies and the integration here, those breeders are be asked, being asked to audit as well. Well, I thought the breeders were asked to audit, but you don't have a big count. First of all, they did not. They did not. So in Minnesota, yes, they're asking, but it's not a standard oh, I, set oh, by NPIP. Yes, true. yep. Okay. Yep. So, as an allied industry member, how can you start 
with your own biosecurity plan based on MPIP, the first place I'll send you is poultryimprovement.org. And the same documents that the producers will have access to are there for access for you as well. And that's where you would start. The first is you will look at the NPIP program standards, and then there will actually be the audit guidelines. That's probably optional for you since you're not auditing, but the, the program standards will be the first place for you to start. So we're gonna go through those um, principles. The first is biosecurity responsibility. Is there an individual that will be your go-to person? for writing this plan, revising it annually, revising it when there's elevated risk, such as migratory seasons, or um, there is an outbreak somewhere close. Your definition of somewhere close will be different <laughs> for every industry. Is it in the same county? Are you in a control area? Is it in the same state? Or is it in the same region? But as the biosecurity coordinator for your designated company or farm site, that's your job, is to define that. What do you consider an elevated risk for your company? Anybody have that role already as biosecurity coordinator? No. Principle number two is training. This will be the biosecurity coordinator's responsibility to make sure this is actually occurring on an annual basis. I hope, and Dale and Shauna probably hope as well, that this happens more than one time a year, but that's all the requirement says, is that there is training one time a year. Um, there will need to be record of that training to occur, and because I'm a good extension person, I've created a record log template for you to use. <laughs> in order to do that. So I'm making it easy for you, and I will send you those resources, or I'll show you those resources in a little bit. Um, so I get for training, is it, you can record it by employee, you could record it by the topic, and whether the employee had trained on that specific topic, um, providing the training opportunities, scheduling it, making sure it gets done. That will be a responsibility biosecurity coordinator um, every year, again, hopefully more than once. Certainly. This is serious. <laughs> so for some of the biosecurity audits that we've already received, some of their training has been from some of the allied industry members. So in other words, they're saying that, you know what, I sat down with Scott Walner we talked about biosecurity, and I consider that part of my training for myself and my employees, or any of the other. I mean, that has happened, and so we've kind of accepted that because some of you folks have been in the industry a long, long time too, and you understand biosecurity and what's going on. But we have had some plans that have come through, and that has been their training. So just so you guys, just so you folks know that, so that at least in Minnesota, I don't think a lot of plans, Shana, but, but, but a couple of them that at least I've done have to have, have that. That's important to know, that you guys are resources. Exactly. Um, exactly and, right. and to be honest, like when you look at the top seven professionals that a farmer will seek advice from, um, extension has moved from a top of the list down to the bottom because we have so many allied industry members who are just as knowledgeable um, and content specific information. Um, so knowing that it's not always the veterinarian, it's not always um, an individual from the company or the integrator, it, it is you, it is a neighbor. Um, so arm yourselves with the knowledge also. So I like that. Exactly, exactly. Um, number three and four, I consider to go hand in hand. Um, it will be the line of separation and the perimeter buffer area. So 
So the line of separation, basic explanation, this is going to be barn level biosecurity, and it's going to be based on isolating those birds. So inclusion biosecurity, if you do have a barn that's hit with something, you're going to keep it in that barn. You're not going to keep it or let it spread anywhere else. Exclusion, you're not going to let anything back into the barn. So this is the turkey research facility in Rosemont that Dr. Noel keeps most of her turkeys at. And you can see the, let me see where's my point, aha, here's the driveway. These are all other research plots and fields. Have any of you been to this facility before? So you will notice now when you drive here, there's a gate. These are raspberry fields, <laughs> strangely. But there's a gate right about here, and then you can drive in. We have all the signage that's required. There's literally a gate with a keypad. Um, there's also um, a truck, a wheel wash right about here past the gate. But all of these are different individual barns. And so I have the red lines there because there's a line of separation at the entry point of every single one of those barns. Um, these are storage sheds. This is their main office. So it's a matter of practicing biosecurity every time an individual crosses that line of separation, enters and exits that building. Does that make sense? Okay, the second term is going to be the perimeter buffer area. That's going to be that farm level type um, perimeter. Primary protection are the people coming and going, any of the vehicles that might be used on site, or the feed truck coming in, and any of the equipment used on site. So again, here is the Rosemont facility. The yellow line is to indicate the perimeter buffer area. I drew this a while ago. I would actually put, take this stuff out, and I would put the line here. So anything that would cross this yellow line that we have control over, we don't have control over the eagles that are nesting nearby, but anything that we could have human control over that crosses that yellow line, it's gonna have to go through a certain protocol. Um, if it's a feed truck, we need to know that there's a delivery coming, that there will be certain protocols. We need to make sure that the wheel wash is turned on. It's an automated system, so it just sprays when, they're, when the sensor is triggered. This university property stop sign, but more like stop, you are entering a secure bird area. Here's the instructions, call this phone number. So there'll be certain protocols and steps that we want to ensure happen here. Going back to um, Mallow Mills as the example, um, their line of separation was just roads. They're also near um, the river, and so they have a lot of bird traffic. Um, they had, they are basically storing raw lumber that they can mill, and what likes to live in wood piles lots of farmets. Um, so they are, when I started working with them, they were already in process of actually setting a perimeter fence. So um, that was sunk into the ground to be able to keep varmints and other critters out, um, be able to better control traffic with the lumber trucks coming in and their bedding trucks going out. Um, one of the other key components of having um, an aerial map like this, which is actually required for the biosecurity plans, is also on these maps you will want to um, indicate the traffic flow patterns of the facility. We want it to go one direction, in one way and out, so that hopefully you're not retracing steps. And that was one of the largest um, undertakings that Mala actually encountered, was changing their entire driveway flow and truck flow um, to the point where they did actually put an addition on so that they could move where they loaded trucks um, so that they could have a one direction flow. So in one gate and out a completely different gate. Um, and I think of other allied businesses that I've been in and you think about the farm traffic that may come in and out of a parking lot. and 
how is that working? So we know if a producer has to go run in and get some supplies, they're driving their farm truck in one driveway and they're probably driving it out the same driveway, right? There's probably ways that we could improve that so it's in one and out another, but it takes effort and it takes money and sometimes getting to the decision maker in order to do something like that. One of the most disgusting examples of shared um, community, I guess, would be a Casey's gas station in Iowa um, when there was the PERS PED outbreak that was really rampant. That the Casey's was probably one of the most infected locations because who doesn't run into town to go grab a Pepsi on the way to the farm? and they're wearing their farm clothes. So it, it's a community thing. Don't leave the farm. Don't leave the um, place of business or the store wearing dirty, dirty boots or potentially contaminated. Um, so be thinking about all those things and having a all in one driveway and all out another driveway can really help create better flow. <laughs> I'm not sure Casey's gas station is going to have a foot and bath <laughs> at the door, but part of that's education for our producers and our ally members um, to help encourage and uh, the awareness of that actually happening. Um, all right, so the fifth principle is personnel. Who do you have working for you? Do you have weekday staff and weekend staff? Do you have um, vacation staff? Do you have the neighbor kids coming in and just helping with chores occasionally? And are they all practicing the same expectations you set for yourselves or your family members who are interacting every day? Um, who, part of that record keeping is having a list of who works for you then that can be compared back to principle number two. Are they trained on these things that you are expecting them? Um, again, I, I worked in extension during high path, but not in poultry. So it always seemed like we were getting the disease alerts on a Monday morning because they had been confirmed on Friday, right? And then the information was coming to you guys on Thursday because the introduction had possibly happened over the previous weekend. Weekend help. Are they being trained the same as the weekday help? The, the regular um, people that are entering and exiting those facilities. Um, number six, wild birds, rodents, and insects. I hope most of you got to hear Dr. Larson yesterday talking about the, the rodent-bird interaction. I was like enthralled with that, and I didn't even know that's what he was working on. Um, so I find that really interesting. So pest control is essential to biosecurity. I had no idea. I've been telling 4-H kids to put rat poison in their barns all summer, and now I'm realizing that that doesn't actually work because the rats are too smart. Who knew? Um, but bird control. Uh, I think Shauna shared once with me that one of the plans said they use high velocity lead as part of their um, pest control. <laughs> Meaning they're shooting the pests. So if that's the plan, that's the plan. Have you ever used a product called Avatrol? I don't personally need to use those things because I'm not allowed to have poultry because of my job, yeah. but <laughs> I, I, I don't know. We used it years ago on our farm. Yeah, as long as you have a restricted use license, yeah. you have a good license, I sell a lot of it in the Midwest um, for control of pigeons, okay. uh, mainly, especially in manure, bunks or whatever. But it was off the market for a while, wasn't um, it? It's available. But yeah, you get it again now and I, because I saved back a supply <clears throat> years ago, but it still works. But oh, it works great. You just, it, it comes in a little five pound container, but you just sprinkle some over some corn. You put it high so only pigeons or nuisance birds can get it. They'll eat it, they'll fly away and die. So, it's a restricted use product. Um, I have Iowa DNR on it right now. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's completely legal. 
And uh, it's a good good option, especially when uh, you're worried about stuff in the fall and the spring. Yeah. Um, people use it then. Writing that down in your plan, that that's part of your control plan, and um, and that's how you're using it. And it's it's a lot of record keeping. Um, and the, what we've encountered with the actual producers is they're always, they're doing these things. They just never actually thought about having to write it down. Um, they know it's time to check the bait boxes and check the, um, check for nests that might be happening. They, they know all that, but it's just a matter of just writing it down. Um, but as far as allied members, specifically stores or any of your offices, um, Again, referring back to Dr. Larson yesterday, the salmonella count from one mouse turd <laughs> blew my mind. One mouse pellet, pellet, not a turd. <laughs> yes, we have to use the scientific term, right? Yes. Um, so, I mean, even if you have mice in your office or in your barn shop, um, you know, one little pellet on the bottom of your shoe what that could potentially spread. So having that type of pest and, and uh, insect amper control is important um, for us personally, um, as well as through our, our um, The seventh, which is going to be in bold, is equipment and vehicles. Specifically, if you are making farm calls, if you're traveling the country, you're going through lots of areas that are poultry dense, what are you doing to clean and disinfect your vehicles? We don't necessarily have great quantifiable numbers about how effective are the car washes at disinfecting our vehicles, but at least you can remove a fair amount of organic material that might be on your vehicle. It's better than nothing, exactly. Um, if you are using um, a gator or a side-by-side -side utility vehicle on site. How is that being cleaned and disinfected on a regular basis? How are you monitoring which barns it's going in or not going in? Um, any of the equipment. So I wish there was like somebody from Ecolab here or something. So if they are going on site and they are contracted to do pest control on a farm, what steps are they taking to disinfect and clean any of their equipment that may have been exposed on farm before they go to the next farm that they have a contract with. Those are things that I think our industry members aren't necessarily thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's what I'm trying to encourage. Um, the rest of the principles likely don't pertain to our allied members because you're probably not dealing with the dead birds. You're probably not dealing with manure or litter management, um, except maybe like for Mala Mills, where they're bringing in new bedding, when there might be, well, okay, so I have heard there are farms that will push all the um, soil litter into a pile, and then it gets hauled away, and where do you think the new, brand new litter ends up? The same place the dirty litter had been. So some of those things are things you need to think about. And as the allied member asking the farm, I personally don't think it's out of line. What would you guys think? Like if they asked you, am I putting litter, clean shavings on an old litter pile, would you be offended? Or, I, I don't know. That's, I guess, up to each producer. It would be different. Um, 13 didn't all fit on one line, and that's actually reporting elevated mortality and morbidity, which is different than what are you doing with your dead birds. The reporting side versus management of the actual, yep, crickets, yep. Yep. Um, so number 10 is replacement poultry. Are How are you receiving them? Are they coming at a time where you have older, more mature birds on the same property? Um, how are you managing them? Water supply, are you getting water from a, a surface source, like a pond? Um, probably in Minnesota, that's not an issue. I, I have, no, 
know if you haven't run across it yet. In the south, apparently, they will use pond water to power wash the barns, but that pond water could potentially be contaminated with feces from a wild bird. Um, obviously, when we only have, you know, like three months a year that we actually have open water, uh, <laughs> probably not our, our issue here. Feed and litter replacement. Um, again, I mentioned, like, what's that traffic flow for a bedding truck to come deliver new litter? What's the traffic flow for a feed truck coming in? Is that feed truck spilling grain on the floor or on the ground? And then are they cleaning it up or are you expected to clean that up? Because then you're just offering a buffet for pests and rodents and it's just a big snowball of a cyclical mess. Yeah. So the mortality under the number eight is composting, is it rendering for some, so some of our allied industries is are you, at, are you at the end of a rendering dry loadout? I mean, are there multiple stops? Are you, is it a dedicated? So it's trying to figure out how that's being handled and if you've got multiple sites, does it go to one Okay, I mean, so that's kind of your mortality plan. And then number 13 is, are you tracking your mortality and if you have a spike, what are you doing? Are you sending samples into a lab? Who is your referring veterinarian? Do you have a testing agent who could collect samples on site? You know, just so there are two, those are really two completely different type things. So just to kind of clarify that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I have 8 through 13, not in bold, because I don't know that it necessarily always would pertain. But I, I do strongly feel that those first seven could be addressed by every allied member that we do have here. Um, so how you actually start with writing a biosecurity plan, whether it's just for yourself um, to say this is what I'm going to do for my customers, that's better than anything, or better than nothing, I should say. Um, but whether, you know, Scott, I don't know if you're going to be able to get the higher ups at the checkerboard to write a biosecurity plan, but maybe it's just what you need, your own thing written down that can hold yourself um, so how do you actually start? <laughs> Print off those guidelines. Um, again, you can find them at um, poultryimprovement.org. And this is how they look. So this is principle three, the line of separation. Does the site-specific plan describe or illustrate the boundaries of a line of separation? So using Scott again for an example, if you're going to different facilities, you're not going to set that line of separation but it's going to be your responsibility to ask that site manager or that site owner, what is their line of separation? What are their expe expectations of you when entering that property? Same with the perimeter buffer area. Maybe they don't even want you to cross the perimeter buffer area. They'll meet you outside the gate or they'll meet you on property. So being familiar with some of these things can even help when I was in sales, if I would have approached my customers like this and asked that question, I think it would have really helped show them that I cared about their operation um, and about their business, essentially. So having that conversation ahead of time, I think is actually very important. But being familiar with and knowing even what to ask, I think is the biggest starting point. Um, so the producers, when they write their plan, they have to be able to answer these questions that are in the red box um, under the blue text. So that's basically what Dale and Sean are looking for when they're reading a biosecurity plan. Is, is it actually addressing these questions and those comments for each of those bullet points? So if you can say yes to all of those things that I've answered those, you're probably pretty good to go. Um, but it's just, it's things to think about and to address. Um, so again, how to start, download those documents. And there are some resources that can help and help guide you. Um, the first is a learning center that I helped create, and I do actually have that. Um, how many of you actually have seen this possibly?
How do I do full screen on this? Okay, so this is the learning module. Um, the web address is z, as in zebra, .umn.edu slash npip. This has been around for about 18 months, so hopefully you've seen it already. If not, let me know, <laughs> and I can give you a tour. Um, but these record keeping templates that I mentioned are here. There's a direct link to the MPIP documents, so you can get right to those principles. So here's more explanation um, of each of those principles, what you should potentially address in your biosecurity plan. Um, the audit guidelines, again, that's, this is that document that has the questions in blue. So can you address those in your plan and do you have a protocol in which to address those? And other resources, I don't even know what I have here. Lots of videos. If you have questions about composting, maybe you're not currently composting mortalities. Again, allied industry, probably not dealing with that. Oh, choosing a disinfectant. This is one of my favorite things that I want this done. Um, <laughs> but it's actually a pretty good, oh, those are really small. It's a good cheat sheet about trying to decide which disinfectant to use, um, specific to weather, whether you have hard water or soft water, um, what you're trying to actually eliminate. So this is a good um, a tool to have 